them. <laughs> you look very nice in your white coats. I have to say, though, it is a little intimidating. <laughs> I'm really happy to be here today. The first thing that I'd like to say is that I really admire and respect you for being here in medical school. I don't think I could do what you're doing. In fact, most people couldn't do what you're doing. And we really need good doctors. So thank you for being here. We're here because medical students in the past convinced us that they benefited from what we had to say. And I hope that you feel the same. Clicker. <laughs> right. Now I'm going to take you back to 1976. I was young, completely unaware and clueless as to what my future held for me. There was no reason to think that we wouldn't have healthy children. Look at us there. We were healthy, strong, athletic. There was no family history. Who would ever guess that anything would be wrong with our kids? So we had the same dreams everyone else did. Not everyone, but a lot of people to have a family, have a home, have a dog, white picket fence. So when I got pregnant with Heather, I was very excited. My pregnancy went along normally. That is, if having morning sickness 24-7 is normal. I never could figure out why they called it morning sickness. <laughs> when I was pregnant, I really didn't worry that something would be wrong with my baby. Why would I? But there was one time where I thought, what would I do if something were wrong with my baby? And I said, but look at all the normal babies that are born every day. Look at all the normal people walking around. There's not going to be anything wrong with your baby. I never worried about it again. Went to the doctor on my due date. I was really ready to not be pregnant anymore, to not be morning sickness anymore. And he said, see you next Friday. I was so disappointed. So next Friday, I went back to my doctor. Again, he said, see you next Friday. I was so mad at him for that. Well, the next week I went in. I'm three weeks overdue now. And he said, I don't think we're going to see you here next Friday. I was really excited. And he was right. That following Tuesday morning, early in the morning, I went into labor. Well, I was really ready, that is, until I was in the car on the way to the hospital. And I thought, I can't get out of this. I can't change my mind. I have to go through with this. I was scared to go through childbirth now that it was here. So I got to the hospital, and I was being wheeled into the delivery room. We didn't know the sex of our babies back then. So when I saw a pile of pink and blue blankets, I thought, I wonder if I'm going to have a boy or a girl. Then once we were in the delivery room, they had a mirror that was mounted on the ceiling perfectly so that we could watch the birth of our first baby. So I'm watching in the mirror, and all of a sudden, I can see the head crown. And she has a lot of dark hair. And I thought, yay, my baby isn't bald. <laughs> and the doctor pulls her out of my body, and he says, congratulations, you have a girl. And I thought, that's great, I have a girl. And he placed her on my abdomen to cut the cord. And immediately, my eyes locked on her arms. They were bent. Immediately, I went into denial. No, no, they're not bent. They're just, they just look bent. 
because she was scrunched up inside of you for so many years. Well, so many months. <laughs> it felt like years. And I thought, after she's been out, out of you for a while, they're going to straighten out. They're not bent. But then I heard her dad ask the doctor, what's wrong with her arms? And the doctor said, I don't know. And I said, well, is everything else OK besides her arms? And he said, I'm so sorry, Debbie. This isn't the kind of baby I anticipated for you. She only has four fingers and four toes. I couldn't believe it. I just wanted to go home and pretend like this wasn't happening. They had to rush Heather away because she was having trouble breathing. She was aspirating, and they had to go clear, clear out her mouth and her lungs and see what was going on. Then they wheeled me into recovery, and Terry went to call, his, to call our parents and let him know what had happened. And while he was gone, I just kept thinking, I, I don't want this to be happening. I just want to go home and get pregnant again and have a different baby because I don't want this baby. And when Terry came back, I was afraid to tell him because it was his baby too. And I felt like a terrible person for thinking this. And finally, I just blurted it out. I don't want this baby. And he said, I don't either. What are we going to do? And for those of you, most of you probably, who are really uncomfortable right now hearing me say that, Heather and Logan sitting right there, I want you to know they understand denial. They understand knee-jerk reactions. And they have spent their entire life with unconditional love. So you don't have to worry <laughs> about them. <laughs> so Heather, well, that day, well, what happened is that night, after everyone left, including their dad, he went home to sleep. He had to go to work the next day. And I was left alone at the hospital with my new reality, which I was not accepting at all. Cried myself to sleep. During the night, I wake up terrified, thinking I had a nightmare. And suddenly, I remembered it wasn't a nightmare. It was really happening. And I cried myself back to sleep, only to have that happen again and again through the night, over and over. In the morning, I was still crying. I couldn't accept my reality. I didn't want to talk to anyone. I didn't want to see anybody. I called the nurse's station, and I asked them to stop all my phone calls, because I couldn't bear to hear those three <coughs> words. I'm so sorry. I stayed by myself in my room. I cried most of that day. And if you really can cry tears out, I did. And by that afternoon, I suddenly started to get curious. Curious about the baby. Mother instincts, perhaps. I wanted to go see her. So I put on my slippers and my bathrobe, and I walked down to the nursery. And I was standing there right outside the window, looking in. Heather was the only baby in the nursery. And I thought, that poor baby. She's all alone in there because all the other babies are with their mother. And her mother doesn't want her. And I'm the mother. And I just stood there with tears streaming down my face, dripping off my chin. And a kind nurse came up and put her arm around my waist. And she said, would you like to go hold her? And I said, yeah. So I scrubbed up, put on my gown, 
She took me to a back room where there was a rocking chair, so I sat in the rocking chair. And I waited. And in walked two nurses with Heather. They asked if I wanted to watch them feed her because that's right, I had forgotten. The doctor came in after Heather was born and he told me she has a cleft palate. That means she has a hole in the roof of her mouth. She won't be able to suck on a nipple. She won't be able to breastfeed. And he also told me about her forefingers and how they were bent and they wouldn't straighten straighten out and that she had small cup-shaped ears and that her, there was something wrong with her eyes, but they were so swollen they couldn't really tell exactly what it was. And I asked him, well, can she see? And he said, well, there's no reason to think she can't see, but we can't actually tell yet because her eyes are swollen and they're not focusing. And I said, well, you know, what about her ears? And he said, I said, can she hear? And he said, well, her ear canals are so tiny. We can't actually see eardrums, but we don't know. We're gonna have to wait and see. And so the nurses came in and they were gonna show me how they were gonna feed her and they had this big syringe. And on one end of the syringe was a quarter inch rubber tube that was about three inches long. And on the other end of the syringe was a ball that they were gonna squeeze and the syringe was full of formula. So they put the tube into Heather's mouth and they put it at the back of her throat so, so she wouldn't gag but far enough back that they could bypass the hole in the roof of her mouth and try and get the formula down into her stomach. And it was not working very well. One nurse ha held her in her hands like she was in a little chair and the other one was working the feeder and Heather was just sitting there with milk coming out her mouth and coming out her nose and just gulp, 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 gulp. And she, was, she looked like she was drowning in her milk. And it was so sad watching this little baby that, that was having so much trouble to, just to eat and to breathe. Well, they finally cleaned her up and they placed her in my arms and they left me alone with her. So I'm sitting there in the rocking chair with Heather in my arms and I'm looking down at her and I'm thinking, this is the baby that was inside me for 10 months. This is the baby that I felt moving and kicking. This is the baby that I was expecting. And looking into her little face, suddenly my heart opened up and it was filled with the most indescribable love that you could ever imagine. And it's that love that has carried me through all the challenges that we faced. Well, Heather was having trouble breathing, so I didn't get to keep her very long. They had to pack her up and take her back to the intensive care where they could watch her. So I went back to my room feeling a lot more like a new mother now. I was very hopeful. I was very excited and I just wanted my baby to be okay so I could take her home. When I got to my room, my dad was there. Now, nobody knew how I was feeling at first, that knee-jerk reaction of not wanting my baby, except Terry. But when my dad showed up, he said, I just want you to know, if you don't want to keep your baby, I have a place all arranged that would take care of her. You know, I was just thinking today, I never did ask him what place he had arranged. <laughs> I said, that's okay, Dad, I'm going to keep her. In fact, do you want to come and see her? So she actually wasn't in intensive care yet. And we walked down to the nursery. And back then, they didn't let anybody be around the baby except Mom and Dad. And so they, a nurse held Heather up to the window, and she looked so cute. She had this long sleeved pink t-shirt on that covered her arms. It was just draping off of her arms. But she had a little pink bow that was stuck to her head and her skin looked like olive skin with dark hair like my dad and like me. 
and she just looked beautiful to me. And I was so happy. So I went back to my room, then my dad left and my visitors left and their dad came, Terry. He was gonna come and have dinner with me and it was supposed to be a celebratory dinner. You know, the first dinner after your baby's born. And we had a little piece of cake with a little pink baby doll on it because we'd had a girl. And I really was excited for Terry to see the baby, but he wasn't ready. And I was disappointed, but I also understood. I'd had the whole day to get used to the whole idea, at least as used to it as I could get in that short amount of time. And he'd gone to work, probably hung out in denial all day, distracting himself from reality, and he was not ready to face it yet. So we were trying to eat our dinner. It wasn't a very happy dinner, as you can imagine. And suddenly there was a knock at the door and in walked the white coats. There must have been a dozen of them. The leader of the pack, Dr. George V.C., heart specialist. Later, we got to know him as Uncle George. He said, I was at home eating my dinner when the phone rang. And when they told me everything that was wrong with your baby, I wondered, why are you even calling me? Obviously, this baby has a lot of problems. Obviously, this baby probably isn't going to live. He said, I just couldn't go on eating my dinner, knowing I hadn't tried. So we want to take your baby to Primary Children's Hospital and do a heart catheter because she has a heart murmur and we don't know why. And she's aspirating and she has jaundice, so much for the olive skin. <laughs> and so he asked us to sign a release form so that they can transport her to Primary Children's Hospital. Well, at the same time, they asked if we would sign an autopsy so that if they needed to do an autopsy, they would have our permission. Like robots, we signed the papers and they left. And together we were talking about this reality that she's probably gonna die. So we started to console ourselves by saying, well, maybe it's for the best because we don't know what kind of life she's gonna have. She's gonna have all these problems. We don't know how to take care of her. Maybe it would be for the best if this happens. Well, a couple hours later, there was a knock at the door and in walks Dr. VC. First thing he said was, if I'd have known her heart looked that good, I wouldn't have done anything. And for one split second, I was disappointed. Then he sat down and he drew a diagram of her heart. There's a valve that usually closes right at birth, but sometimes the valve doesn't close, but it usually closes within the first year. And he felt confident that that was probably the case with Heather. She was still aspirating, she still had jaundice, she was still having problems. And I was glad that she was in good hands because I actually went down to see her in the intensive care before they transported her to Primary Children's Hospital, and no one had warned me what I was gonna see. I thought I was gonna see that cute little baby that they held up at the window when I went down there with my dad. And instead I walk in and here she is all hooked up to all these wires, and she's just breathing up and down really fast and her skin's really yellow. And That is one time in my life, sec well, another time later, but that's the first time I actually almost passed out. I was just shocked at what I saw. And of course, the nurse apologized and felt so bad that she hadn't warned me. So I felt so good that Heather was at Primary Children's Hospital and in good hands, but I still didn't know if she was gonna live or not. So that night, Terry left and I was left alone by myself again. During the night, they wheeled another mother into my room because she just had a baby and I had a double room with no one in there. So during the night, they brought me her baby. 
And you can imagine how shocking that was and how sad that was. I said, that's not my baby. My baby's at Primary Children's Hospital, and I don't know if she's going to live or die. And that nurse was horrified, apologetic, of course. Well, the next morning when I woke up, I thought, there's really no reason for me to stay at the hospital. My baby's not here at the hospital. And all I wanted to do was go see her. And you know, back then, I don't know how it is nowadays, but back then, insurance paid for us to stay in the hospital three days and three nights after we had a baby. And I always say there weren't drive-by deliveries back then, because I hear about people coming to the hospital, popping out their baby, and going right home. Well, I really couldn't see any point of staying in the hospital. I just wanted to go see Heather, so I told the nurses I wanted to check out. So they arranged, and they brought me a wheelchair, and I'm in the wheelchair, and my lap's piled with flowers, and I'm getting ready to go out of the hospital, and I was just struck with heartache because in my fantasies, this day was going to be so different. I had a sweater and some booties that I had crocheted that I was going to put on my baby. I had a yellow gingham quilt that I had tied that I was going to wrap my baby in. And I was going to take my baby home with me. And it was going to be in the cute little nursery that I'd set up with matching gingham curtains and all the trimmings. But instead, I was going to see her at the hospital, and I didn't know if she was going to live or not. So I got, made it to Primary Children's Hospital. We scrubbed up, put on a gown. We went in, and there she was just laying in the little bassinet. And this is, she's only 10 days old, actually, up at Primary Children's Hospital in this picture. And she was just laying there on her stomach with her arms down by her side, and she looked so tiny in that little isolate. And all I could do was look at her through the glass. Next to Heather, there was another baby in an isolate. And its parents were about our age, and this was their first baby. And their baby didn't have any arms or legs. And that was the first time that I had the profound experience of appreciating what I had and not focusing on what I didn't have. My baby had arms. They were little arms, but they were arms. And she had legs. And it's that perception and that focus that's helped carry me through challenges, is focusing on what I have. And that's what helps Heather and Logan as well. Well, they were having a hard time feeding Heather enough to feel like she was going to get her nutrition. All I wanted to do was take her home. Terry was getting worried because I was getting very attached. And they still hadn't told us that she was going to live. So finally, I said, when can I take her home? And they said, well, if you learn how to tube feed her, you can take her home. That way, we can be assured that she'll get enough nutrition. Well, I was scared, as you can imagine. I knew I could drown her if I got the tube into her lungs instead of her stomach. But I was determined to learn. So the nurses taught me how to intubate Heather. And I intubated her. and. I finally got to take her home after two weeks. So I finally took her home, and they sent the Breck feeder home with me. And one kind nurse brought me this great, big, long lamb's nipple. And if you haven't seen a lamb's nipple, they're, they're about this long. And it's black. And instead of using the tube at the end of the syringe, that I used the lamb's nipple, and I put a little bit bigger of a hole in it. So I sat in that rocking chair pretty much all day long watching soap operas <laughs> as I fed Heather so that I wouldn't have to tube feed her and so that she would get enough nutrition. Well, I'd only been home about a week before I had to go to my first doctor appointment because she had a cleft palate. And they have to close 
the hard part of the palate when she's six weeks old. Well, that was only three weeks away. So I bundled her up and I went to see the plastic surgeon. I'm sitting in the plastic surgeon's office now and in walks the plastic surgeon. And the first thing he said when he saw Heather is, what's her problem? And I said, well, I, they think she has Treacher Collins. Treacher Collins is a condition that has the same facial characteristics, but it doesn't have the arm characteristics. And he said, well, that's not her only problem. You can imagine how I felt. Then he went on to ask me questions. Did you do drugs while you were pregnant? Did their dad do drugs? Well, it wasn't his questions that were painful. It was how he asked the questions. We'd already been asked those questions, but I didn't feel like I felt with him that day. I couldn't wait to get out of that office. I went out to my car. I leaned on my steering wheel and I burst into tears. I was completely overwhelmed with all of Heather's problems that were in my face, all the surgeries, that horrible doctor. I went home, I called their office. If I'd had a cell phone, I would have called right then and there. I called the office and I said, I don't want that doctor doing surgery on my baby. I don't want him anywhere near my baby. And I asked for his associate to do the surgery. So three weeks later, she went in, she had the surgery. Terry spent the night. I came up in the morning, I wanted to be there at 6 a.m. so that I could be there when the doctors made their rounds and they could tell me everything that was going on with her. And I waited for the doctor and in walked Mr. Personality. <laughs> <laughs> I was not very excited to see him. So he went on to tell me all about Heather and then he left. And I spent the day and Terry spent the other night and the next morning I was up there bright and early at six o'clock in the morning and waiting for the doctor and in walks Mr. Wonderful. <laughs> I was starting to warm up to him a little bit. I was starting to appreciate his intelligence, his abilities. I could see that he really cared and that he was very serious about his work. And you do want someone that's serious about their work when they're taking care of your child, or you for that matter. And, you know, I was just thinking today, have any of you seen Doc Martin? He was my Doc Martin. <laughs> if you haven't seen it, you should take a look. It's a series, this doctor is so direct, and, and it's just funny. You just can't believe someone can be so direct and rude to people, but so good at what they do. So, that doctor became one of my favorite doctors. He made me laugh. He was just so ridiculously blunt. So I couldn't wait to take him and show him Logan after Logan was born. I wanted to see what he was gonna say. <laughs> so I'm in his office, I'm hanging out, I'm waiting. He walks in and he goes, you got fixed, didn't you? <laughs> And I said, no, but their dad did. <laughs> and he said, well, maybe you should get fixed too so this doesn't happen again. And then he sticks his head out the door to call in his colleagues and he says, come here, you guys gotta see this. It's like two peas out of the same pod. Well, he went on to do the plastic surgeries on Heather's eyes, and we saw him for many future years. Well, Logan's not born yet. Back to my story. I'm at home with Heather. Now she's 18 months old. And I get a phone call from the geneticist. And the geneticist says, we don't think she has Treacher Collins anymore. We've been doing a little research and we think that she has either Nogger syndrome, which is a dominant gene, which would mean that you would have a 50% reoccurrence rate, or she has this really rare condition, there's only three cases in medical history called postaxial post acrofacial dysostosis. 
but we don't know which one she is. So we're sending all of her x-rays and all of her medical reports to another doctor. And if he doesn't know, nobody knows. So I went home and I waited and a couple weeks went by and I ended up going back to his office and he said, okay, we decided she has postaxial acrofacial dysostosis, later called Miller syndrome, thank heavens. <laughs> <laughs> and he went on to say, it won't happen again. It was a chain mutation. I said, what's that? As the, as the cells were dividing, they just kind of misdivided and they just went on and kept dividing that way and you ended up with Heather. But chances of it happening again are one in a million, probably even less than that. In fact, you probably have a better chance of having a healthy baby than the average population because it already happened. How crazy is that? <laughs> well, <laughs> I was excited to hear that because I wanted to have another baby. In fact, I wanted a boy because I thought it would be better to have a boy because then Heather wouldn't have a healthy sister that she would constantly be comparing herself with. So when I was reading a magazine and I came across an article on how to have a boy, <laughs> I read it very closely and I followed the instructions and apparently it worked. <laughs> and I decided that when Heather turned three years old, that would probably be a good time to have another child. She'd be out of diapers, off her pacifier, all that good stuff. Well, I was so excited I took my temperature and I, right when I tried to get pregnant, I got pregnant. I was so excited. I went along, you know, morning sickness started to subside after about four months thanks to a miracle drug called Bendectin, which unfortunately they took off the market because of all the lawsuits, but it saved me in both of my pregnancies. <laughs> so I'm going along and I'm thinking everything's going to be okay. The geneticist said it's not going to happen again. About seven months along. I started thinking, you know, it might be a good idea to get an ultrasound because it might be a good idea to be prepared, just in case, just in case. Besides, it would be kind of fun to know the sex of my baby. So at seven months, I went in to have an ultrasound. And the x-ray technician said, wow, congratulations, you have a healthy girl. Interesting, huh? Ultrasounds weren't as good back then as they are now, obviously. <laughs> So I went home feeling very confident. I saw the picture. It looked like a healthy fist to me. So I went home pretty confident there were no problems, although I knew that they could be wrong about the sex of the baby. Well, we're going along, we're waiting, we're taking care of Heather. Finally, the due date comes. And I go to the doctor and he says, see you in a week. So I go back home and luckily, I was only about a week overdue. So I go into labor. Of all days of the year, could anybody guess what day I went into labor? Just take a wild guess. How about April Fool's Day? <laughs> Logan was born on April Fool's Day. <laughs> So we go to take Heather to my mom's, and, and Terry said, I think we should play an April Fool's joke on people and tell them that, we, that our baby has the same problems Heather does. I said, that would be a terrible April Fool's joke. We are not going to do that. So we went to the hospital. We're being wheeled into the delivery room. We're in the delivery room. The mirror's on the ceiling. It's a repeat experience. There's the doctor, the nurse, Terry, and me. You could have heard a pin drop in there. The anticipation was so thick. Well, the doctor pulls Logan out of my body. The same bent arms. It is just absolutely unbelievable and that word doesn't even come close and Terry said son of a <laughs> and I said to the doctor 
does he have a cleft palate? And he said, yeah, he does. And I was so disappointed because I wanted to nurse. I heard the weight just falls off when you nurse. <laughs> And I'd made this great big cape and applique a sign on it that said, out to lunch. <laughs> and I was gonna wear it when I nursed in public because I thought it was ridiculous back then that women didn't nurse in public. They had to go find some dirty little bathroom somewhere and nurse. So I was really disappointed. Guess I was gonna have to lose my weight on my own. <laughs> well, Logan was having trouble breathing just like Heather was. And I'll tell you what, I was so scared because I loved him immediately I had my little boy and he had red hair and he was the cutest little guy and I didn't know if he was going to make it because he was struggling breathing and they had to go put him in the isolate in intensive care they did keep him in the same hospital that I was in which was really nice so I went back to my room and I started making phone calls I called my girlfriend I said Hey, we got a boy, he's just like Heather, except he has red hair. Silence. April Fool, she said, April Fools. No, really, he's just like Heather, but he has red hair. Well, I spent a lot of time that day consoling my friends and my family to try and make them feel better that I'm okay. It's okay. Of course I was worried. Of course I was scared. Of course I was disappointed. But Heather was three years old, so we had a better idea of what to expect. Well, all I wanted to do again was bring Logan home. I had to go home without him, but I had Heather to take care of. That helped. And then I'd go see him. I'd spend the day with him every day. I pumped my, my milk wasn't supposed to come in. They gave me a pill to stop it, but it came in, so I pumped it and tried to take him the milk, but that was challenging. So I did the best I could. He was there for two weeks. Again, finally, they said, if, you're, if you'll two feed him so that he gets enough to eat, then you can take him home. I said, okay. So the day came, I had a new baby doll for Heather, a little rubber baby doll, so she could put it in the water and give it a bath and do everything that I did with Logan so that she wouldn't get jealous and she wouldn't feel left out. There would be no sibling rivalry. <laughs> And she wrapped her doll in a blanket, and I wrapped Logan up in his quilt, and at home, we went home. Well, I'd only had Logan home for one week before he aspirated on his formula, and he turned blue, and he quit breathing, and I was terrified. And I called 911, and I'm trying to give him mouth to mouth, and I've never even been taught how to give anybody mouth to mouth. And finally, the ambulance gets there, and Logan just starts screaming, thank heavens, because then he started breathing again. And of course, we took him to the hospital and they didn't know what was wrong. And of course, his doctor was, was out of town. And by the way, that same doctor is pediatrician. I forgot to tell you this. When I was in recovery after Logan was born, he came in and he slapped me on the leg and he said, congratulations, you just made medical history. I don't remember being offended by that. <laughs> but I can see the, I can hear the gasp in the audience when I told that story. So he's out of town. They don't know what's wrong with Logan. So he gets stuck with needles in his head, head and IVs everywhere they can put them. So finally, a week later, I'm taking Logan home again. No way am I going to try and feed him with the Breck feeder after going through that. I'm tube feeding him. So I tube fed Logan for six months. I had a system. <laughs> I taped the syringe to my face and let the formula just go down into his stomach while I did chores. Sometimes I'd put him in his infant seat on the counter and tape it to the cupboard while I did the dishes. And I did that for six months and it became just a natural routine in our everyday life. I even had a babysitter that I left it tape to his face, and if he was feeding, I'd just say, as soon as the milk's gone, just unhook it, shut the lid, and I'd just leave it stuck to his face. So, of course, Heather had to tube feed her baby doll as well. <laughs> she was such a good little mother. Heather loved her brother. By the way, Logan painted this. 
he, well, this, this is the photograph, but Logan did a painting of it. Um, I hopefully he brought it. So Heather loved her brother. There was a lot of love in our family. Terry loved Heather. Terry loved Logan. Terry loved me. The medical bills were piling up. His dream was to have a black car, a black motorcycle, and a home by the time he was 30. He achieved those goals and one by one had to sell his motorcycle. I watched a banker drive away our car. We had to sell our house. We had nowhere to go. Luckily, my dad owned a fourplex, and one of them was vacant, so we moved in there. We couldn't leave Salt Lake yet because Heather had surgery scheduled. Logan had surgery scheduled. We were going to go live in southern Utah with his grandparents and take care of them, and that would kind of be a job. But that didn't work out. So you can imagine Terry with all of his dreams, how hard that was. I was still being a good mother. I was still being a good wife. I had everything important to me, my husband, my children, a roof over my head, food in my stomach. But he didn't have anything that he planned on having. And he had the burden on his shoulders of how am I going to pay for this? How are we going to do this? And he went into depression, especially after he, lo he lost his job. And I didn't realize he was suicidal at the time. I didn't realize that. It wasn't until way later that I found that out. Well, he got a job. He found an escape in the form of his secretary. He tried to escape his reality. And I'll tell you what, it kept him alive. So it's pretty hard to judge people sometimes because you don't know. You don't know what the outcome is going to be. But he left us. Heather was five, Logan was two, and I was left a single mom, two disabled kids. He stayed in Salt Lake for a little while taking them every other weekend and on Wednesdays, which was great for me to have a break. But then he moved to Michigan. That was almost harder than the original breakup because I had him 24-7. I had surgeries alone, night and day. But all that love helped me through all of that. So I ended up applying for, when I was taking him to Disabled Children's Services, they told me about SSI, Supplemental Security Income, a program that the government has to help people that have disabilities. And because my income was so low, I could qualify for Heather and Logan to each receive SSI. And that helped me make ends meet. It helped me put food in their belly. That's how we made it. And the rest of the story, not the rest of the story, but a lot of the story is in this book that I wrote because, you know, somewhere along the way I realized how many lessons I was learning and how sad it would be if I died and I didn't share any of those lessons with anybody and they just died with me when they could help people. So that's why I wrote the book. Eight Fingers and Eight Toes. Accepting Life's Challenges.